All right. Um, welcome everyone. I hope that you guys can see uh, my screen and see myself and can hear me as well. If not, please, as usual, um, just let me know in the chat or um, raise your hand. I think we have that feature available. Um, so let's see. Um, before we start, I have a couple of um, reminders or announcements, if you wish. Uh, so one thing I forget, I forgot to mention last time is when you try to submit your assignments in the assignment Dropbox. So if you go to uh, the course website here on the top, you have assignment Dropbox. And of course, it will ask you to log in to submit the, the assignment. So you just upload the, the files. And after uploading the files, that's, that's it. There is no confirmation process. So just to let you know that. What else? Um, OK, so we saw this last class. And yesterday, during the office hours, I, I show and comment about this. Um, it's important that you don't set the working directory in your scripts. Uh, neither in the in the file that contains the functions, neither in the testing script. Okay, uh, the reason is if you source a particular directory that only exists in your uh, computer, um, then whenever someone else tries to run that script, if that exact location doesn't exist, uh, then it will fail. So it's a case of what we call um, hard coding. Uh, and it's kind of the same idea of the global variables. If you have a global variable that is called in a particular manner, and then it, that variable doesn't exist in, in, in the session of the user using your function, then it will fail. So please do not set the working directory in your scripts. Um, do that in the terminal just for testing and running your functions. The other thing I don't remember if I mentioned is when I'm going to grade your assignments, I'm going to actually run your functions. So it's better that they run, so they should work properly, right? And, and one of the things that may break uh, the functions, especially if I run them, is this thing of having uh, the set wd function or command in the scripts themselves. OK, so we're going to be talking about vectors today. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask you if you have any questions about the assignment or the lectures that we discussed last week. I'm going to give you like probably 20, 30 seconds to see if there is any questions uh, in the in the chat. Um, yeah, so let me go to, uh, sorry. So I'm going to uh, unmute you. So if you want to speak up, I'm going to repeat the question or if you want to just uh, Place the question in the in the chat, whatever you prefer. So, hi. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question is about the first uh, function, right? The quadratic equation. And I ask you to compute two things. Well, I ask you to compute several things, uh, but you're talking about the, de the derivatives, right? So because the function is uh, a coefficient times x squared plus another coefficient times x plus an independent term, you can take, well, you can take as many derivatives as you wish, but the ones that are not trivial in this regard is when you take the first derivative and this is given by, so the coefficient in terms uh, in front of the first term or x the independent variable will be 2a so this is the value here the second term in the first derivative is b because if i take the derivative of this i x the derivative of x is one so my first derivative is actually 2 2a times x plus b equals zero so what i'm asking you is to create basically a list that contains in one of the elements 2a and in the other b and now I also ask you to compute the second derivative, which is usually known in, in when, when you interpret this equation as a, as a, as a parabola, as a, as a geometrical object, is known as the uh, concavity. And this is only just taking one more derivative, which is 2 times a, and that is it. So you need to...
Oh no 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 no. What what I what I meant. So the question is, uh, do I do I mean to have uh, two a two a two a x plus b equals zero? No, I only want to have one term that gives me the value of two a and one term that gives me the value of b. If we go to the example here, so the example is run with the default value, which I believe is um, a equal one and b and c equal zero. What you see first here is in the equation, you get the three coefficients that is used for the equation. Then you get the determinant, you get the two roots that in this case, both are equal to zero. And then you get the first derivative, first term of the derivative, which is actually two A. So in this case, two, and then the second term, which is B, which is zero. And then the second derivative again is two A. So it's a bit, you know, uh, kind of, redundant information if you wish, but this is more for having the exercise of creating a list and then returning up, uh, values inside the list. No, because the second derivative is still 2a, right? So if you, if you get the second derivative and because a is 1, uh, then you just do 2 times 1 and so that's, that's 2. Okay, no problem. Any other questions? Okay, so we are going then to start our third lecture. Um, I think I have something in the chat. It's all hard for men to look exactly like yours. Same name and variable. Okay, Jennifer, uh, thank you for the question. I could say so, uh, just more than for anything for sake of knowing that you guys understand how to create the list. Someone was asking yesterday in the office hours, for instance, um, if instead of calling uh, the coefficients, A, B, and C could call differently. And I was suggesting, well, you know, if it confuse you because then we will have the default values, uh, which I imagine you will call A, B, and C, or the arguments to the function, which you will call A, B, and C. Um, sure, you can rename it like, x2, x1, and x0, or something like that. That's, that's fine. It's, uh, I, don't, I, I don't really care if you rename things that uh, still make sense. Uh, but what I do really want to have is this kind of a structure, and that's why I print, actually, the, the object that this function is returning. So I want to have a list that contain one, two, three lists, and then a couple of other variables, like the determinant and the second derivative. Okay, and I think this is also specified here in this bullet point. So it tells you exactly what kind of a structure should be inside the list. Okay, let me know, Jennifer, if that is clear. So Laura, um, when you say you will run the, the functions, you mean that the print str command should not be in our function itself, that you will run them in the print quadratic equation or str12. So, correct. So what, what, so, Yes and no. Okay, so let's go back to the functions. So the quadratic equation doesn't return anything in the screen. It doesn't print anything in the screen. Okay, so for this, what I will expect to see when I run it is nothing will show up. Now, the petit pen only is a different function because it has to print this thing in the screen, actually all this. So the recipe for the number of pieces that you indicated, the ingredients, and how the recipe was computed. But also, but also this is important, it should return an object. In this case, it's a, it's a simple list with five elements, identifying basically what it was printed in the screen. So for the petit pen only uh, function, you have to actually print something in the screen. Now, let me go a little bit uh, further in the assignment for the test functions. And someone was asking me, and, and it's true, this function, this function, and this function, when I'm going to run your script, uh, it won't print anything because it's just returning, right? It's not printing anything in the screen. So someone was asking, do you want me to assign this to a variable and then print on the screen? That, at that point, it's up to you. What I'm going to really look into this script is that you are calling um, the functions properly and that you are sourcing the functions and more or less to have good commenting like shown in the example. So to sum up, uh, for the quadratic um, 
equation function. No, I'm not looking for printing any, anything in the screen uh, like this. So this I will run myself. Um, for this function, I'm not looking to have the STR. This was to show you more or less how I structured the function and what type of object, what type of structure I hope the list will have. Okay, let me know if that is clear. So Jennifer, um, is STR pulse a typo in the assignment? Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, probably it is. Let me see. Who, yes, yes, it is. I'm sorry about that. It should be 12 pieces instead of 12 paints. I was thinking about pieces and paints. Um, a pain in, 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 in French for not paint the, the, the something that is so but pain of, of in French is bread. So, yes, I'm sorry about that. That's um, we fix that. So, it should be 12 pieces. That's correct. Sorry about that. Okay. I think those are really good questions. I think that we don't have any other questions in the chat, nor anyone else raising the hands. So I'm going to go ahead and start the lecture. But if you guys have any other questions, just let me know, OK? So what we are going to um, discuss today is a quite important topic. Actually, both of these topics are two topics in this lecture. Uh, one is called flow control structures or functions or commands and the other is vectors i know we talk a little bit about vectors in the first um first week last last uh, i think the first lecture actually last week um but we are going to take a a, a deeper uh, dive into vectors because they are quite important and they are very very efficient uh in the way they are implemented in R. so the plan for today is to discuss loops conditionals and vectors so first of all, let me start by, I think I mentioned something about this last, last class, but um, there are some basic building blocks uh, in any programming language. So some of the things we are going to be discussing today, we are going to focus on how to implement in R, but these, these features, these functions, these um, methodologies, if you wish, are ava available in any programming language. So all programming languages has some basic version of this looping constructs and uh, loops are useful for repeating tasks so every time that you want to do something and repeat n times being n something very large or very small it doesn't matter you want to repeat exactly the same thing you use a for loop what is called a for loop or a loop construct actually we're going to see that there are more than just one way of looping you know the other thing that is super important is what we call conditionals and so conditionals are good to make decisions. So I can instruct my code to do something if a particular value or a particular condition is met or not. So in some way you are allowing the program, the code, to take decisions, to, to make decisions, to um, change uh, the, the output or the, the, the procedure that is going to follow by just using these conditions. And then the last one, which we can also last class and you guys are implementing for this assignment, is the ability to group commands into functional units, for instance, functions or scripts, the scripts we are going to be talking a little bit more uh, next class. And of course, R has all of these features, but as I say, these are very generic. Almost any, I would say, basically all programming languages should have these type of features available because are the very basic building blocks in which uh, programming is based on. Okay, so we're going to look at them very carefully. So let's start by loops. So loops are a feature of all programming languages, and it's basically a structure, a sentence. It's more than a sentence. It's, it's the body of a sequence of sentences that allows the same piece of code to run over and over and again. So basically, repeat, repeat, repeat. And computers are really good in repeating. They don't get tired by doing that. As as human beings, so that is a very uh, useful feature to have in programming languages. Each time the, the piece of code is run, uh, one or more variables will change in the loop, and this is important because if we don't allow for something changing inside the loop, there's no way the computer will know when to stop the loop. 
And this is a typical bug. So if you remember, we discussed bugs last, last week. So bug is a, a mistake, an error in the code that we are not aware and that changes the behavior that we expect to see in the code. So having what we call infinite loops, meaning a loop that never ends, is a typical bug, a typical error in, in, in calling loops. Uh, why loops are useful? Well, it's way more efficient and it follows this idea of not repeating code because if I had to repeat a task 10 times and it only changed the value of a particular variable and I can't control how that variable change instead of copying 10 times the same piece of code I just, just use a, a, a loop to, to repeat that okay um, the other interesting thing with loops and this happened with many coding structures and I have seen some of you trying this in the functions it's not required though is that it can be nested so you can have functions inside functions and you can have loops inside loops okay just to let you know about that so let's take a look at how R implements loops. So the first uh, method that we are going to see for loops is what we call a for loop. Okay. And so let me show you the example on the side and then basically, you know, the, 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 the left side of the slide try to explain what you see here. So let's go through this. So I'm going to create a vector. Okay. B with the word he hello word from A vector okay so if i print b i define b in this way if i print b we say the words hello world from a vector okay i just defined we saw this last class now i'm going to start a for loop here and of course it starts with the word for so that is a specific command that are identifies for for loops then what comes is a parenthesis as we have seen in other functions and then it says i in b i open the curly brace and i close the curly brace so if you guys remember from last class and for creating your functions for the assignment that is what we call a, a, a call block so what this means is for every value in the vector b i'm going to repeat that okay and the instruction inside the loop is cat which is similar to print it will print something in the screen the main difference with print is it doesn't include the bracket notation and also we need to add this slash n so that it goes to the next line so what this for loop will end up doing is it's going to take each of the possible values inside the vector b and for each time it will print that to the screen go to the next line print the next one and so on so basically i is what we call a looping variable and basically it takes each possible value and for each possible value in the vector executes the instructions within the call block that defines following the fold okay is that clear this is a super important thing i know that if you have seen this before in any other language this should be trivial but if this is the first time there are a lot of elements that i want you to understand and to grasp from here first is the for word so this is the command that establish that we are in a for loop so we are going to repeat something the condition for the repetition is given between the parentheses that immediately follow the for command and whatever is going to be repeated is defined by the call block that follows the parentheses containing the condition okay what the conditions say is which is the looping variable i and what values is going to take so this is a particular way in which i say for the looping variable in the vector so what i will end up doing is taking the bo the, uh, the value hello executing this line that's why it says hello taking and uh, arrive to the end of the code block go back and say I'm, I'm going to catch the next word word print that go to the next one print that go to the next one print that go to the next one print that and that's the output that you will see by executing this okay let me show you another quick example notice that i is something i pick i could have picked a different name and here i'm picking shay is is customary to usually for looping variables use letters like i shay k not mandatory at all sometimes i use a whole word because it's cleaner and, and, and clear in the code 
but sometimes you see a lot of people using for loops with variables named ijk or something like that so in this case i'm going to create a list on the fly inside the parentheses for the conditional as the for loop so i will say for j in the list defined by cow the value one and capital f which means false and then opically braces cut the variable j which is my looping variable new line and curly braces okay so in this case the list is given by the value by the word cow by the value one and by the value false so and that's exactly what the cut command will print so first it prints cow because it's the first thing it finds in the list then it prints one that's the value here and then it prints false that's the one that we specify with capital f any questions about this again this is I know I have been uh, going slowly here, I hope it's slowly enough, so everyone can catch all the details in the for loop. If not, please let me know in, in the chat or uh, just raise your hand. Okay. So, okay. What is happening if I use um, for loop for nested list? Great question. What will happen is it's going to go inside. So if you have a nested list, let's take the example of um, the variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's take uh, the example of the assignment, not the variable. Let's take the example of the assignment where you have a nested list. So one of the elements in the nested list is going to be a list. So what will happen actually with this for loop is it will it will not work because cat cannot print list as per se as a whole list it can print the elements within the list so what you will need to do in that case is you need to modify this for loop to use print so print can actually print the whole list but it will basically it doesn't matter if it is a list it doesn't matter if it is a vector we are going to see other ways we can create for loops what basically will happen is it go it will go by each of the basic elements of the structure and execute whatever function you put between the code block Okay, it's a good question, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, sometimes one of the answers I will give you is try it, because that's one of the advantages or, or, or nice things of R. If you think about something that is not clear how it will behave, you can just go and try it, okay? But that's, that's what will happen. It will go and, and take each of the elements. So someone was asking what is C? So we saw, I think, C uh, in the first week is the function for creating vectors. And we are going to come back to this C, but basically you can think about C. Remember in my first lecture, I, I select different variable names and I explicitly say I'm not going to use C because C has a special meaning and means that it can create, concatenate, combine um, elements in a vector. And that is what it's doing here. So it's creating a vector uh, which all these words. So in this case, the example for the for loop is looping over a vector. In this case, it's looping over a list. The difference is, is very subtle because in this case, all the elements are the same type, strings, while in this case, we have a combination of strings, numbers, and booleans. Okay, so let me see if we have any more questions. Looks like we may be clear. Okay, again, keep, keep the questions coming. We'll continue to the next slide, but please con uh, keep, keep the questions coming. So this is the other for loop structure that we are going to discuss in R. And this one is, is not as common as the for loop. Um, it's called the while loop. So the while loop, what happens is it will execute. So it's, it looks pretty much the same as a for loop, but instead of starting with for, it starts with while. The condition goes between parentheses, and then there is a code block defined by our curly braces. Now, the difference between the for loop and, and the while is that basically you use a for loop when you know a priori how many times you want to repeat something. So, for instance, in the for loop I showed you before, I was repeating for every single element in the vector or the list. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat something until certain condition is uh, reached. So, in this case, what goes inside the parentheses is my test condition. When this test condition is satisfied, 
uh, then I stop the while. So what happened here is I am starting or initializing a variable i with the value 1. I'm going to start my while loop while the value of i is less than 4. I'm going to repeat whatever is in the curly, in the curly braces. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm printing i, next line, and this is very important, I'm increasing i by 1. Okay? I go to the question just in a second. Let me just finish the example and we go to the question. Um, what happened here when you execute this? It will print 1, 2, and 3 because it starts with 1. It says, is i less than 4? Yes, it is. Print i. Increase i by 1. Now, i is 2. Is 2 less than 4? Yes, it is. Print 2. Increase i by 1. Now, i is 3. Print i. Increase i by 1. i is 4 now. So, is 4 less than 4? No, it is not. 4 is equal to 4. So, I stop my while loop and then boom, done. Right? Just one more thing and I go to the question. Don't do this because this is an infinite loop. It says, while true, print hello. It will print hello for a very long, long time. If you, if you happen to try this, just press Ctrl C. It will kill your loop. It will stop the infinite loop. This is trivial, this is obvious, but sometimes our conditions are a little bit more involved than this one, and you may run into this. Okay, so be aware of that. So let me go to the chat. I think we have a question there. Um, okay, no question. So I saw something blinking. Uh, maybe someone raised. I'm just checking if there is someone with uh, hands up. No? Okay. Sorry, I saw, I saw something blinking in the panel and I thought there was a question, but I don't see any new questions. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, any questions about the while loop? Very similar to the for loop, but in, once, in one way, uh, you use while loops when you don't know a priori how many, how many uh, times you want to repeat something. For loops are more like deterministic on that manner, okay? Let me just uh, tell you, there is a third type of loop repeats. We are not going to cover that one, um, but just to let you know. Okay, so can you have more than one conditional? Yes, you can, but you need to combine them. And we're going to see that as soon as we hit the if state. And that's, and that's why everything is, is together. So you can, have, you can have something like, while i is smaller than 4, and while i is greater than 2. So in that case, it will print only the values 3, basically. And we are going to see that just in a second. Okay? So yes, you can combine more than one conditional for sure. Um, and here we go, conditional as it is. So let me just double check. Let me know, Robert, if that is clear or that was what you meant. Um, otherwise, we, we take it back, okay? So, conditionals. Um, perfect. So, sorry, I'm trying to manage too many windows here. So, um, conditionals are related to Booleans. So, this is very important, and this is why one of the main reasons why we have Boolean variables in R is because now we can ask questions. So, for instance, I can ask the question Is the word pants? And notice the double equal sign. Remember this one is very important. Another uh, typical uh, bug here is to forget the double equal sign. Sometimes by just not paying attention or just by a typo, uh, you know that you have to write the double equal sign, but you just write equal, and then things start to break down because you're conditional, your question. So the double equal sign means, is this equal to that? So is pants equal to blue? And the answer is, no, it is not. Pants is pants. Blue is blue. So these are two different words, right? So what happened here is R basically respond to your question, is pants equal to blue, with a false. If I would have written is pants, meaning pants quotation marks, equal to pants quotation marks, then it will say true. Why I'm saying this? Because in this way of asking questions, then we can use this keyword, this function, if you wish, if. So this conditional if allows us to ask questions. So if pants is equal to blue, then yay for pants. 
Of course, this condition is false. So similarly to what happened with the for loop and the while loop, whatever is between the curly braces and the code block is going to be executed only when the condition inside the parentheses is true. So if the condition is not true, right, so pants is not equal to blue, then this is not going to happen. So if you type this function, if you type this command, it won't print anything because pants is not equal to blue. Okay, so conditions are quite simple, sort of. Sometimes the complexity comes in the conditions that we write inside the parentheses. So let's take a quick look at this <coughs> example here. So we're going to combine a for loop with a conditional. And this is where things start to get uh, like interesting, I would say. Okay, so let's take a look at the for loop first. So for i, my looping variable, so I'm defining the values that i is going to take here because it's a for i and then I'm defining a vector in the same condition with the values 1, 2, 3. Right, so that's my definition for the for loop. The curly braces for the for loop goes up to here. And this inside that I have an if statement and it says if the value of the variable i is less than 2 then print the value of i and then go to the next line. If you execute this what you will see in the screen is just the value of 1. So let's go through this exercise and see what happened here. So for i in c given by 1, 2, 3 so for i which is going to take the values 1, 2 and 3 then I'm going to execute this three times because there are three values. So when i takes the value of 1, I ask the question, if 1 less than 2, yes it is, then I'm going to print 1. The next time, i will have the value of 2. So if 2 um, is smaller than 2, and the answer is it is not, it's equal, so I'm not going to print this. The third time, I will have the value of 3. Is 3 smaller than 2? And of course, it is not, so I'm not going to print. So that's why we end up with just the value of 1. Okay? Any questions about this? Let me check the chat. As I thought before that... Um, okay. Looks like it's all clean. Let me check in the other chat. So remember, we had also the chat from the um, education website. So it looks all clear, okay? So let me know. We are going to crank up a little bit the, the examples, but these are the very basics, okay? So if you have any questions about this, just let me know. Okay. So a little bit more about Boolean operators before, before combining more examples. So I shall show you the equal operator, but also we were using the smaller than operator so is 2 less than 3 and yes it is now I can ask also for inequality so is the word arms and when I put the exclamation sign in front of the equal means it's different is the word arms different from the word legs and then I will say yes it is of course true that's true Robert was asking about this I believe and we combine conditionals can I ask this question and this question together? Meaning, can I ask if 2 is less than 3 and if arms is different from legs? And the answer is, yes, you can. And for that, we use this symbol, the ampersand symbol. Okay? So the ampersand symbol means and. And this, uh, so the basis of this, I'm not going to go through this because on the one hand, probably many of you are familiar with this and it's kind of, uh, after you see once it's kind of trivial, but the basis of this is what we call um, tables of true or true tables. Basically, you can do all kind of combinations uh, of true and falses and combine with and or or operators. And depending on the on, on that is the answer you will have. So, but it's basically just pure logic if you ask me, right? Is two smaller than three? Yes, it is. Is arms different from legs? Yes, it is. Are both things true? Yes, they are. And that's why you get a true. Now, is two smaller than three? Yes, it is. Is arms equal to leg? Not it isn't. And the combination of these two is a false. Now, pay attention to this. 
if instead of asking for an R, I'm sorry, I ask for OR, the answer is of course yes, it's true, because one of these is true. So it's enough to have one of these two things to be true in order to be true the whole condition. Okay, again, very important thing here, very basic stuff. I just want you to, to understand what is going on here. Okay, so let's take one second to see if we have any questions. I'm going to check my chat here. Okay, looks fine. Again, don't hesitate to ask questions. Again, these are basic stuff, but very important ones. One thing I also want to emphasize is that this course will build up on previous lectures, right? So now we are using variables that we discussed last class. By next class, we are going to be using conditionals, for loops, uh, all these things, like if we were very familiar with that. So it's very important you, you understand the very basics of this. So don't hesitate, please, in ask any questions about this, okay? I take my preaching and also try to give you time to, to digest this and ask the questions. So, a little bit more about conditionals. So, and again, remember, the if statement executes this code block if the condition is true. But, one of the nice things of this is we can combine this with the word else to execute the opposite. So, what we say here is, if pan's equal to blue, we know it is not, but if it were true, then it will say yay for pants. If it is not true, meaning this is false, so the opposite has to be true, so pants is different from blue in this case, else boo for pants. And that is what this if statement will end up printing, boo for pants, because pants is different from blue. Okay, so this is like the complement uh, in logic is called or in probability you wish, the opposite of this condition okay any questions about this one more example again combining for loop with a conditional and then the complement of the conditional which is the else statement okay for i in the vector one two three so this is our for loop and up here and then our if statement goes from here all the way to here as if the variable is smaller than 2 print the variable else too big okay and this is the output that you see one too big too big so let's go element by element in the loop and see what happened so i in and i take the first value one if one is one smaller than two yes it is print one now important very important whenever i hit the condition and it's true i execute only the first call block i do not execute the else so the else is a skip is the condition in the if statement is true All right so i execute the print of i and go to my next element in the vector so i now has the value of two if is uh, two is smaller than two it is not it's, it, it is equal right so now i execute my else statement and it prints too big so these are mutually exclusive if i execute one i do not execute the other one so r if it executes one it skips the other one okay very important to understand that i come back to my for loop at the header of the for loop i take the value of three is three is smaller than two it is not. So this condition is not true. So I go to my else statement and then I print too big. Okay. Any questions about this? The other thing I want to, to emphasize here is notice how indentation starts to be very important now. Okay, I go to the question in a second. I forget to mention this, but I go to the question to a second. I can very easily identify where my if statement is because I can see where everything is aligned here and I can see the level of indentation going up. So this is a question we had last week. When should I increase my indentation? Uh, every time that we open a call block, I say, and you can see that here, how the, the, uh, the function inside the call block of the if statement 
is on the one more level. Okay, and this is for clarity sake. It helps me, and I hope it will help you as well, seeing how the flow of the code is. The other thing I think we I address in the office hour is you don't need to write, I think I mentioned this, you don't need to write these plus signs, neither when you are typing this in the console, in the R terminal, nor in your scripts. This is something that R writes for you automatically when you are typing things um, uh, interactively. Okay? So I think we have a question here, so let's see. Uh, what happens if I use a while instead of a for loop? Um, it happens, so the, the behavior, so let's say that's a good question, uh, Anshin. So uh, let's say that I change this for loop for a while loop, that's the question. So the first thing I have to change is the condition here. So what is my, my stopping condition? So this is not a stopping condition, this is a selection condition. So a stopping condition will be like we saw in the previous example, while i is less than 4, and let's say that we initialize i with 1. So if I go back to that example, so let's say we put i equal to 1 at the beginning, and then while i is smaller than 4, and then I need to add the increment in i, because otherwise this will keep working, uh, going forever, well, basically, it will basically print exactly the same. One, because the condition here doesn't change. So, and the values that I will take doesn't change. Um, so it will print one, too big, and too big. And because we go up to four, it will basically repeat one more time. Okay? But that's, that's a very good point. So in this case, I prefer the for loop because, as I say, I know how many times I want to repeat that. The while used in the manner of incrementing a variable i collapses or you can think of another way of implementing a for loop now you use while loops when your conditions are a little bit more elaborated more rich I will say so in that way you can control better the repetitions within the loop okay uh, let me know please if, if that is not clear so I think we have another question um, let's see is it necessary uh, to use functions within a function here? Could you just use... Okay, good. So, um, Laura is asking if we can... So, we are not using functions, okay? So, remember the code blocks we saw the first time for defining functions, but the way that are implemented in these examples are not functions, okay? Just a terminology thing, it's just a code block. It's a piece of instructions, a, a set of instructions that are executed at once. That was our definition of, of, uh, of call block. And this is exactly what is happening here. So um, you can, so let me go back to your question because I wanted to emphasize that, but I missed the question. So yes, you could. Uh, so you could, so the answer is yes. I'm hesitant to say yes right away for the following reason. I really like to see call blocks because in the same way that indentation helps you identify or visualize the flow of the of the call, uh, the curly braces help you identify the units that you're supposed to execute when, for instance, you're using a for loop or you're using a, a, a if statement. True to be told is this sentence, this if statement with the else, all this for R is just one line. So I could say for parentheses i in C123 and the next line and not use the curly braces at all and, she, and they just have my if statement. Okay. Furthermore, if my if is something like this here, I could pro completely avoid the curly braces. So I could have this, this example right here, all without any curly braces at all. Okay. For me, and again for clarity's sake, I would recommend not doing it, but R will allow you to do that. Now, I, I saw another question, I will go right away to that, but just one more thing is important that I emphasize. Whenever you have the complement of the if, whenever you have the else statement also present, and this is, this is required by R, so it will give you all kind of weird errors or, or errors that are not easy to understand. It has to be structured in this way. So basically, when you have the else, are once the closing curly brace, 
in the same line as the else as well as the opening curly brace okay so my answer to uh, i think it was a laura question is uh in some cases you can avoid the curly braces i would recommend having them for clarity especially considering that sometimes r can be very picky with the way that interpret these things okay okay i think uh so okay we have a couple more of questions um okay i think i answered uh, laura please let me know if not uh, yes sorry go ahead oh okay sorry question was answered so chen yi um do people put functions in loops or people prefer to define functions outside of loop okay good question i would recommend put the functions so you are meaning defining a function right so in principle you could but i would strongly recommend putting outside the function outside the loop and the reason is every time you are redefining the function right and so the the r is going to spend some time defining the function as well as some memory if you put that function definition outside the for loop then you define that function only once you don't need to redo the thing um, and again it will help with the clarity of the code okay it's possible that r will um, identify that this function is being redefined it may or may not i'm not guaranteeing that and not executing it but for clarity's sake and for performance issues i would definitely recommend putting the function outside the function definition outside the for loop you can of course call the, the the function as many times as you want inside the for loop but the function definition i will put it outside we're going to come back to this it's a, it's a really good question and you i really like uh, see your, your questions because you are looking into the tiny uh, nasty details of the language and that is very good because at the end it will it will uh, impact in the performance of the code and and how elegant the code is and we're going to come back to this probably in a couple of weeks when we're going to explore some super useful functions um, that allow you to do this kind of, of tricks uh, that you guys are, are kind of pointing to so that's that's a really uh, very nice line of thought okay so keep again keep the questions coming okay so i think we covered this example okay so <clears throat> this is one more com example and we're going to go through this very quickly but this shows how um convolute this kind of conditionals and 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 looping and, and call blocks can go okay so take a quick look at this we we are running a little bit late um but take a quick look at this and let's take a look and see what happened here so we have first of all a very first for loop uh that goes it's going to take a variable that will go through the values one two three and four define it in a list and then it's going to ask a sequence of conditional questions so it will ask if i is smaller than two then print something then it will say else and notice what i'm doing here i'm combining with a new if statement i could have open curly braces here but just because what we were saying before this is just one line believe it or not then i'm going to just write my if statement there so i'm going to ask if the value of the variable is smaller than two and then do something if that is the case if it is not then i will ask is equal to three and then i go i'm going to print go three if it is not equal to three i'm going to ask is greater than three and then i'm going to print the value of that variable and if it is not greater than three then i will be going to print no good when you execute this this is the output you will sub one no good go three four and five so let's go through this very quickly first um, iteration of the for loop i will have the value of one that's the first element so the question is is one smaller than two and it will say yes it is and then i'm going to go and just print one that's my first output remember what happened here whatever comes after is the complement whatever comes after the else is the complement of that condition meaning it's the opposite so r will just not look at that at all it will say i print two i print one boom next element in the list and that ne next element is two so now the question is is two smaller than two i say no 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 it is not it's equal to two then i'm going to ask is 
the element equal to 3 and 2 is not equal to 3 so then I'm coming here I'm going to say is 2 greater than 3 mm -mm. 2 is not greater than 3 then I'm going to print no good and that's what you get for your second iteration we hit the end go back to the top 3 now I has the value of 3 is 3 smaller than 2? Mm -mm. 3 is not smaller than 2 is 3 equal to 3? yes it is 3 is equal to 3 then we print go 3 and then we hit the end go back Okay, remember the else's when my condition is satisfied are completely ignored. Okay, next element is a 4. Is 4 smaller than 2? No, it is. Is 4 equal to 3? No, it is. Is 4 greater than 3? Yes, it is. Then I'm going to print that value and that's your 4. Because I hit my condition, go back to the top. i equal to 5 now. 5 smaller than 2? No, it is. 5 equal to 3? No, it is. 5 greater than 3? Yes, it is. Then I print my 5. Go back to the top. Nothing else to be done. I'm done with my fold. Okay. This is probably one of the most, um, not complex, because of course there can be way more complex examples, but more uh, meaty examples or juicy examples in this slice. Okay, so if you understand this example, I guarantee you, you, you are fine with for loops and if statements. If you don't understand it at first glance, pay, spend some time looking at it, try to, to run this for loop by hand as we just did. And hopefully you, you will be able to see what is going on here and understand the output that we are having here. Okay. Of course, ask questions if if it is uh, if something is not clear. Okay. In the meanwhile, let me check if you have any questions. Okay. In the meanwhile, we are going to switch now to vectors. Okay. And try to do this quickly. So we talk about vectors. Vectors are one of these composite types that are offers. They are homogeneous. What it means is they have to be all of the same type differently from lists. Lists allow you to have a combination of different type of variables, but vectors has to be all of the same type. They cannot be nested. So in the assignment, I ask you to create a couple of nested lists. So vectors cannot be nested. And because of all of the three conditions, it's homogeneous, it's a compact and, and, ne and non-nested, they are way more efficient. I can process them way faster than what they can process lists. So here are some examples of how to define vectors with numbers, with words as we did in the example, and how they look like if you ask for the structure. They give you just the type and then the values because all of them are of the same type. Another way to define a vector is to use the colon operator. I don't remember if we saw this, but when you say 1 colon 17, basically what R does is it completes the sequence of numbers between 1 and 17. So if you ask what is D, is 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 70. Okay. Someone was asking C, what was C today? Is the, is the function to combine values into a vector or a list, depending if they have the same type or not. Okay. okay let's do this question. Yes, it does include 17. That's right, Richard. It's not like Python, so I know that you are familiar with Python. So Python is, is not inclusive, but R it is. Yeah. And here you have an example. So 1 to 10 gives you 1, 2, 3, all up to 10. If you don't want to use the colon operator, all you need to jump ahead, if you need to have a stride between the elements, you can use the seek function So for sequence. So sequence has initial, end, and the stride. So it will, it will go from 2 to 20, taking sums of 4, so skipping 4 numbers. So 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, and it reaches, this one stops at the closest number before the condition. Okay. Now, this is interesting because now, I think we saw the paste function last time. Paste allows you to combine strings, so we can paste the letter A with values 1 to 5, 
and this is an argument for the function it says sep equal empty so quotation mark quotation mark otherwise by default you will put a space and this way you can create very easily labels for let's say experiments so i have the letter a and then values one to five as we saw here this will give you one two three four and five and what i will do is it will recycle it's called recycling the thing it will take this value and put as many of these as elements are in the longest um, value set that you have for the function alternatively you can or independently you can use the repetition functions rep which will take the letter so the letter is one of these predefined data sets of r and the first five elements which are the letters a b c d and e and repeat this three times so in this way you can create repetitions so you take the first five letters of the alphabet and you repeat them three times with the rep function. Okay? And this creates a vector, by the way. So if you remember these diagnostic functions we told last class or last week, we can ask if 1 to 10 or 1 colon 10 is a vector, and I will say yes, it is a vector. Okay? So just a little bit of a teaser of vectors. Now, this is super important as well and it's related you will see it will relate in a second to the conditionals and it's especially important for all this type of composite um, uh, objects that are handled so it's important for vectors and we are going to see in the context of vectors but it's also important for lists and for data frames so we are going to come back to this but this is the, the very basic so i'm going to create this vector a from 2 to 20 skipping four elements so my, element, my vector has the values 2, 6, 10, 14, and 18. If I want to grab the fourth element of the vector, I will say a bracket 4, and that will give me the value 14, because it's the fourth element in this vector. So this is what we call the index. Now, one thing I can do is, because 2 column 4 is a vector, which contains the value 3 and 4, is I can select at once the three elements the second third and fourth elements of the vector a by doing a bracket two column four and that will give me this second third and fourth element of the vector okay i can also select the elements first second and fourth of the vector by using c one two four and that gives me first second and fourth element of the vector okay so this, in a very, a very general matter, is called a slicing. So I'm taking a slices of my vector, very specific slices, the, these consecutive elements of these specific elements. And one thing that you can do with a slicing is remove elements. So when I put, and again, this is something different in Python for any, any, anyone fluid in Python. I believe Python behaves a little bit different here. Uh, when you do minus, this will remove the elements from the vector. So if I want to remove first, second, and third elements, two, six, and ten, I can do a vector minus the vector one, two, and three, and basically it takes away the first three elements. I could have done also minus one, colon three, and it will have only, as a reminder, 14 and 18, which is the fourth and fifth element of the vector. Okay? Also, I can do, I can combine this with the sequence command. So sequence 1 to 5, every 2, it will give you 1, 3, and 5. And that is what A of sequence 1 to 5, every 2, gives you. First, third, and fifth. Third, third, and fifth. And, and fifth. Okay? Any questions about this? This is called, again, a slicing. It works with vectors, lists, and data frames. Okay, and we're going to see how to make this more meaningful somehow. So we saw word Boolean operators before, right? Um, <clears throat> we saw how to ask questions. If a given variable was smaller than a value, if something was equal, if something was different, how to combine this with AND or OR. So let's see this. So we still have the same vector as before, okay? 2, 6, 10, 4, 14, and 18. So can I ask the question, is A smaller than A, uh, than 8? And then R will return the operation applied to each of the elements in the vector. 
So in this case, it's true for the first two elements and false for the other three elements. Okay. Now, look at this. This is super important. Because this is true and these are false, I can now slice my original vector in this manner. I can ask, give me the elements where a is smaller than 8. And then I will get 2 and 6. So remember, a was 2, 6, 10, 14, and 18. So these last three elements which return false to the question, is a smaller than 8? then are not selected by the condition give me the elements a smaller than a. Okay, here is another example. b is the sequence of values from 1 to 60 every 13. So this is the values that you get when you do that, 1, 14, 27, 14, 53. So I'm going to ask the question, is b equal to 38? And then r will answer, well, it is not is false for all single elements in B because B does not contain 38. Okay, I think Robert was asking about this on, uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Can I combine conditions? Yes, you can. And here is another example. I'm going to ask the question, where is B greater than the 5? Well, obviously, after the second elements, all of them are greater than 5. And then I ask the question, where is B smaller than 50? And then um, all the first four elements are smaller than 50. Now I ask the, qu the question, where is b greater than 5 and smaller than 50? Well, it's only in these three elements where b is greater than 5 and smaller than 50. And that's exactly what r returns. It returns false for the first one because it's not greater than 5. It returns true for the second, third, and fourth element because they are greater than 5 and smaller than 50 and returns false for the last element because even when it is bigger than 5, it's not smaller than 50. Okay. Similarly, I can ask the condition with an OR. Where is B smaller than 10 or B greater than 30? So if I look at the numbers, here is a smaller than 10 and all of these are greater than 30. So what I will end up having here is all the elements with the exception of the second one. And that's what you see here. So you get this one because it's smaller than 10. Sorry, the second and the third one. You don't get the two, the second and third one because they are not greater than 30, nor smaller than 10. And you, de and you do get the last two because they are greater than 30. Okay, I tell, the, I tell you the question just in a second. Alternately, so this is the same condition, the same question I was asking before. Alternately, I can use the which function. So this function, what that returns is which elements, which indices of elements hold this condition. And you can see here, it's the first one, the fourth one, and the fifth. And that is exactly what the which function returns. Let me check the question. Okay. Do you need parentheses? Um, I tell you what, this is a very similar question to the curly braces. In many in many cases you will see that I prefer to have extra parentheses and this is a personal check because or a sorry, personal preference because it allows me to check very easily um, the operations I want to do like in particular so for this one here you I will say you probably don't need because R will use the and and or operators to separate this but visually it helps me here Similarly with, with this one here, in other cases it is mandatory, okay? My recommendation again will be keep them uh, unless they confuse you, right? If you are better reading these expressions without the parentheses, remove them. Uh, if not, I will, I will keep it, okay? Now I told you this, this technique, again, this is a slicing, but now a slicing by conditions not just by, by positions in the in the vector, uh, applies also to data frames. And this is an example of how. If you remember the trees data frame from the last class, we can look at the volume of the trees and ask, in me, all the entries where the volume is greater than 56. So I take my data frame, open my brackets for do the slicing, and then write the condition. And the condition in this case, the volume greater than 56. And notice the comma here. The comma is neither here because what it means is I want all the variables, all the columns 
basically. So here you are selecting which rows hold that condition and the comma tells me, okay, give me all the columns in that data frame. So in this case, I get rows 28 and 31, which uh, are trees that have a volume greater than 56. Okay. Any questions about this? So these are the really important parts. We still have a couple more of slides to go. I hope it won't take uh, too long and I apologize for, for taking a little bit less of time, but I prefer to, again, to go a little bit slower and be sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions and to try to answer as many questions as you guys have. So I apologize for, for the extra time. I hope it's not going to be more than five to 10 minutes, okay? Can you add elements to pre-existent uh, vectors? Yes, but there are caveats, okay? So let's say I start with a vector with values 1, 2, 3. And now I want to increase, uh, to incorporate new elements in the vector. So one way to do this is to take the vector, and this, is, this can be funny looking and sometimes mind-blowing the first time you see. You take the vector A and you combine the elements that are in A, 1, 2, 3, with the new element you want to add, okay? Now I add 4, so now I have 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I do it again, and I take 1, 2, 3, and 4, and combine with 3, 5, and now I have a vector that has 5 elements. Okay? Another way to do this, and this is a little bit more involved, if you wish, is take the element, do a slicing, a particular way of doing the slicing. Length of A returns how many elements are in the vector, Okay, so A at this point has five elements, so length of A will be five. So it will say a slice five plus one, that gives you six, and put six in the position. So basically you are creating a new, a new slot in the vector. And if you do that, you get six elements. Now I'm putting in my comments here um, that in both cases, this is a bad idea. And I tell you why. If you have five elements, you have a hundred elements, you have thousand elements, ten thousand elements, no problem. You probably are going to be okay. You have one million elements, and you are doing this kind of operations even for one element, trying to add one element to a one million long vector, you may crash your computer running out of memory. And I tell you why. The reason is when R finds this operation, what it will do is, it will take the original vector, it will create a replica of that vector in memory, add the new element to the replica, and then assign it to the original. So for a given moment in time, you are duplicating the memory footprint, the memory utilization, uh, because of this operation or this operation. So again, if you are way below the maximum capacity in the memory of your computer doing these operations with a smaller vectors no problem this is totally doable this is is accepted by r it will work just as expected however if you are dealing with what we call big data if you are sequencing the genome of a given virus or proteins or something that is very demanding in terms of data you have big big data this may crash your code from running a computer that is starting, doesn't have enough memory, okay? So just to be aware of this, a way to uh, mitigate this uh, is to do this instead. You predefine a vector with the expected length um, that you expect to see. So let's say that you expect to have a million and a half elements, then you initialize the vector using the vector function and you specify how long you expect to have the vector. Another way is you initialize with zeros, and then you assign to the given element uh, the value that you want, okay? Again, this is, this is just more uh, um, a prescription, a, a word of advice, if you ask me, um, because extending vectors can incur in these memory problems, but it also can be a slow because R needs to copy this million element uh, vectors, right? So this is more a, a, a sign note for people working with big data or planning to work with big data, okay? I, I should mention this. Now, one more thing I want to mention, and this is related to the way that we were adding elements, and this is uh, something that is super, super useful in R, and it's almost unique for R. 
Other languages like Python can incorporate this concept by using standard libraries, but R bring it just uh, as part of the language itself is the not available uh, indicator, NA. So whenever you, you see an NA, you know that there is data missing. So the example that we have is this vector A that by now has six elements, one to six. And I'm going to use this technique that I, I told you is not the most efficient one, it's still valid, to add a ninth element to the vector with the value of nine. So I'm skipping elements seven and eight. So R will say, okay, because I initialized with repetition of zeros, I will have zeros, four, five, and then I could have NAs because you didn't specify any values for elements seven and eight, but you specify the value for nine. Now, NAs are super important because when you deal with real data, they crawl all over the place. So being able to handle NAs and identify NAs is, is crucial when, when doing data analysis. So R provides one of these diagnostic functions to say, is there any NAs in my data, in this case in the vector A? And it will reply, reply false when there is real data and true when there is actually NAs in place. Okay? Interestingly, you can do all this logic with the exclamation sign operator that in front of the equal means different and in front of a boolean means state the opposite. So if NA is true, when I put the exclamation sign in front, it will be false. So what I'm doing here is a very sophisticated way of slicing my vector, saying return me only the values of the vector where there is not, by putting the exclamation sign, not an NA. So I only get the values 0, 0, 0, 4, 5, and 9. One more thing. R brings a lot of functions that we're going to use in next assignment, like the sum, which basically add together all the elements in a vector. So if I sum the vector, meaning sum all the elements in the vector, and the vector has NAs, the result will be an NA, because R does not know how to proceed with an NA, with missing data, right? That missing data can be anything. So there is a keyword, there is an argument that you can pass to the function, which is called na.rm. It stands for na remove equal true. You are basically instructing the function, instructing R to proceed with the sum only with the elements that are not na in the vector. Okay? So super important, many, many functions, sum, average, standard deviation, many functions that we're going to see have that flag, that argument that you can incorporate to the function. And actually, that takes me to the next slide. So there is a super useful function in R called help. So you can write help, parentheses, and any other function in R, and it will bring the documentation, how to use the function, or the quotation mark name of the function. That will present information in the screen how to use the function. Another super useful function to explore functions is the example function. So you can ask for example of the function sum and it will show you how to use the function. So again, very useful functions to keep in mind. I'm going to ask you to use these functions to explore functions that we are going to be using in assignment two. Okay. What else we have for today? Okay, so this is just a, a couple more of the slides and we are done, I promise. Uh, I have here, we have seen this, A given by one column five, that will give you one to five. What happens if I add one to this? And this is where parentheses start to, to be important. Someone was asking about this. So what I usually will do is I want to write one and we're going to write parentheses one to five parentheses plus one. And in this case, it's clear to me that what R is doing is, is creating the vector one to five and then adding one. Now, we saw this with the rep example some, sli some slice ago. R, R has this recycling behavior. It basically takes this one and repeats the one added to each of the previous elements in the vector. So it had a vector one to five, so I'm going to add one to each of the elements. So A is going to be two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. We saw this rep command, so rep will create five copies of the value two, and notice the dot here, this is, um, is one, an old way of writing values to specify these are uh, real numbers, it has a decimal point, it's not mandatory, by the way, 
usually get that question, that's why I'm clarifying. And now I have the values 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and then 5 values uh, of 2, and I do A times B. And what I do, what I get is basically this element by 2, this element by 2, by 2, by 2, and by 2, and that's the result. So multiplication works element-wise, element by element. Okay? Now, the important take-home message from here is you don't need to perform any looping as we were doing at the beginning to perform these mathematical operations. And this is super important because this is the most efficient way to do it in R. In many other languages, the only way to achieve this is to loop over the elements. But in R, this works just out of the, uh, of, of the language. So you just do A plus B or A times B and it just works. Similarly, with other mathematical functions, sine of A will compute the sine value given by the elements 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in this case, and return just the value. Okay. So, this is the example where I don't really want you to do this with a for loop. So, let's, see, let's say that uh, you had to do the multiplication as we were doing before. So, let's say that we had the vectors A. Uh, given by 3 to 7, B given from 6 to 10, and E being repetitions of zeros. So this is where we are going to place our results. The function sequence along A will give you the values of the indices of A, because A has five elements, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Each element has an index associated with the position in the vector, given by 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. So if I want to do the multiplication of A times B, I will just do A times B. Many people will be tempted, especially people having a previous knowledge of programming, will be tempted to do this multiplication by doing a for loop. And this is doable, this is okay, you can still do it. So I'm going to loop I in the sequence of values of A, so in this case 1, 2, 3, and 4, basically going to go through each of the elements in the vector, Take the element, multiply by corresponding element in B, put in E, and do this five times for every element in the, in the vector. Now, the other day someone was asking about the complexity as a way to measure the number of operations performed in, in computation. This is, the order of this is the number of elements in the vector. And again, if I have a million elements, I will do this a million times. This takes just one operation. This is called vectorization super super important to use super fast modern chips in computer take full advantage of the hardware of the computer when you do vectorization okay so summary and I, again i apologize for taking longer we saw we saw loops uh, that's for repeating things in programming we saw conditionals that's for asking and making decisions in programming we saw vectors that's the homogeneous composite type that is performance driven because it has a lot of operations like slicing and vectorization that make things run super fast. We saw the not available concept in R and then we saw the uh, built-in help and example functions that are super useful for understanding and learning what other functions in R can achieve. I think we are done for today. I'm going to be in the chat for a few more minutes if you guys have questions. Uh, if not, I remind you, we have the forum in the course website that some of you have been uh, using asking questions there. We have the email, courses at signet.utoronto.ca for asking questions. And um, of, if not, uh, I will see you on Thursday.